Only relics remain today of the great civilizations that once dominated the Middle East. Their writings and their great works have, for the most part, been clouded over with the dust of time. From remote antiquity, mass migrations and conquests have brought new blood and new ideas to this world. Here arose the three great monotheistic religions, and here too evolved the earliest codes of law. This region is indeed the cradle of civilization, yet it has always been a center of unrest, and struggles for supremacy continue here today. They continue in a region which, after its glorious beginnings, lay fallow for hundreds of years. The peoples of the Middle East seem at times to have little in common except their newly developed sense of national identity, and for most of them, the Muslim religion. Turbulent stirrings of nationalism are taking place among peoples who have rarely known a representative government. Newly developed oil resources have helped to make the Middle East a focal point of rivalry between the Soviet Union and the Western world. The Middle East is bounded by a series of natural barriers that separate it from the three continents. Separate it, but do not seal it off where access is possible through four principal gateways that pierce the natural bulwarks. The first is the Dardanelles and the Bosphorus, narrow strips of water separating Europe from Asia. The second gateway is the steppe land that lies between the eastern shore of the Caspian Sea and the Hindu Kush mountains of Afghanistan. is the Nile Valley, a fertile ribbon in a burning stretch of desert. And the fourth, sea routes made up of the Red Sea and the Persian Gulf on the east and the Mediterranean upon the west. There is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is the prophet of Allah. The muezzin in his minaret gives this call five times daily, and the hearts of the faithful turn toward Mecca. For 13 centuries, they have worshiped daily. Teachers called mullahs have instructed the sons of believers in the Quran and have taught every Muslim to venerate the holy city of Mecca and turn in prayer to the Kaaba, which enshrines the sacred black rock. Christmas is celebrated in Bethlehem. For 600 years following the birth of Christ, much of the Middle East was under the influence of Christianity. The city of Jerusalem is holy to Muslims, Christians, and Jews alike. The desert, where the only feasible mode of existence has been that of the wandering herder, has served for centuries as the home of roving nomadic tribes. By Western standards, the existence of the nomad or Bedouin is a poor, rootless way of life. But he has traditionally enjoyed great prestige in the Arab world. His hospitality is legendary. The Bedouin moves primarily to find new water and fresh grass for his livestock. But his restlessness stems also from an independent tradition 
where personal freedom is highly prized. In many areas of the Middle East, this way of life is changing with the advent of modern technology. And the Bedouins' days of wandering seem numbered. The camel, once a proud symbol of the nomad's wealth, is today a less important economic asset. As he faces the future, the Bedouin's choices are few. He can either enter the army or become a herder of sheep and goats. With great loss of face, he can become a sedentary farmer. Fresh water, or the lack of it, largely governs the life of this region, and for the inhabitants, it can mean survival or death. Come ye to the waters, cries the prophet Isaiah, for water in the Middle East is always the water of life. Over 90% of this region is desert, with great extremes of temperature, almost no rain, and only a scant vegetation. The lands are either desert or sown, and the peoples of the Middle East have had to conform to this pattern. Where there is an annual overflow of the rivers, the farmers gather the rich black silt and redistribute it on the dry land. Recently, a modern farm implements begun to replace the ancient wooden plow. Where there is water, grain is cultivated. Once the grain is cut, it is treaded by oxen on the threshing floor, or else flayed by hand. The Old Testament speaks of the chaff which the wind bloweth away. And today, all over the Middle East, grain is still winnowed as in ancient times. Disaster is a constant threat. Disaster from drought and from plagues of locusts. And there is frequently the pressure of the absentee landlord. To the simple uneducated farmer, the absentee owner is often a hated figure represented by a cold, calculating overseer. The peasant is usually a tenant farmer or sharecropper, and for his labor receives only 50%, and sometimes as little as 20% of the crop. But in spite of his exploitation at the hands of the landlords, the peasant has been one of the most stable elements in the entire Middle East. For thousands of years, these villages have been the backbone of Middle Eastern life, barely supporting their own inhabitants while providing the food and luxuries consumed in the cities. Because of filth and inadequate medical services, disease is rampant, and the life expectancy of the people is very short. Their energies are sapped by disease and malnutrition. The village women wash their clothes here, they also wash their dishes, pots, and animals. And this same water is carried home for cooking and drinking. Naturally, these streams are a constant source of dysentery and other diseases. For many of these peasants, city life seems to offer an escape from the poverty of the village. Thousands of them drift yearly to the cities, often only to face greater poverty swept up in the sights, sounds, and smells of a novel and exciting world, 
the peasant's horizons are enlarged, and he comes to covet the luxuries he cannot afford. Though he is destitute, his glimpses of opulence kindle in him the vision of a new and better way of life. Side by side with the old city is the modern metropolis. Here lives the wealthy owner class. These people are few in number, but their influence extends to every walk of life. They are themselves ready to adopt many advanced features of Western life. But where their workers are concerned, they are suspicious of any change which might threaten their own interest. Between these two extremes, there is a growing group of professional people, intellectuals and military men who take a deep interest in social and economic problems. They are forming the basis of a middle class where none has existed before. And it is they who often are the agitators in the coffee houses and the leaders of revolutionary movements. For many people in the Middle East, the word student is synonymous with agitation and shouting mobs for students are often the only organized and militant intellectual group in a country. In Egypt, they are constantly watched by the police. Each student must carry a special identity card. Strikes, in which university students are joined by pupils from the secondary schools, are common in some Middle Eastern countries and may occur on the slightest pretext. Yet in the main, the serious pursuit of learning goes on. And at a growing number of universities throughout the region, young minds eager for knowledge get their first exposure to a new and exciting world of ideas. Foreign universities in the Middle East have produced many of the leaders of modern nationalist movements. Congregational and Presbyterian ministers founded the American University of Beirut and Robert College in Istanbul. With them came Western ideals of freedom and of national identity based upon a tradition of democracy. Here at Aleppo College in Syria, the student body numbers over 700, of whom 240 are girls. Students come here from all over the Middle East. Classes are given in English, and the instructors are mostly Syrian Christians. Although university education is expanding, the great problem in the Middle East is in the villages. In a tiny school in Iran, typical of many found throughout the region, the facilities are primitive. The 
The teacher makes his own study aid. His pupils are lucky, however, for in most villages, there is no school at all. One of the incidental benefits afforded by village schools is the opportunity for regular medical checkups by government doctors. For most of these children, it is probably the first health examination they have ever received. This is an inspection and treatment aimed at the culprit, trachoma, a dreaded eye disease which causes an appalling amount of blindness. Of all the children of the Middle East, those in the refugee camps are most desperately in need of attention. Nearly a million Palestinian Arabs are living as refugees in neighboring Arab countries. They have not been allowed to return to Palestine and no new home has been found for them. The United Nations and other agencies, all with tragically small appropriations, have sought to feed and care for them on a few pennies a day. Bitter and disillusioned, they have become pawns in the political struggles in the Middle East. The Arab position is that these refugees must be allowed to return to their old homes in Palestine. Israel feels that they should be resettled elsewhere. Whoever is right, these people must be given permanent homes and a chance to work. The refugee camps have placed a serious burden on the state of Jordan in particular by adding to its already grave internal problems. An armed truce exists between Jordan and its neighbor, the new state of Israel. In the ancient city of Jerusalem, soldiers of the Arab Legion stand a 24-hour guard on the walls of the old city. And from their post, they can literally look into the homes of their enemy. The Mandelbaum Gate in Jerusalem is the only legal passageway between Israel and Jordan. Twice a year on the Christian holy days, pilgrims are allowed to come through freely with special passes. The Arab sector contains the whole of the old city, and within its walls stand many of the shrines of the three great religions. In an area of many problems, one of the most complex and delicate is that of the State of Israel. In 1948, the Israeli army established the Jewish homeland in the face of bitter Arab resistance. With great energy and resourcefulness and finance from abroad, Israel built a modern state in the Middle East. And the Israeli kibbutzim, or communes, have created garden spots in the wilderness. The Turkish Republic has proved to be the strongest and most stable nation in the Middle East. The northern part of Turkey borders the Soviet Union along a thousand mile frontier. To keep Turkey strong, American military advisors work closely with Turkish officers in planning for the nation's defense. Turkey's allegiance is steadfastly to the West and its political structure is clearly Western oriented. Turkey was proclaimed a republic in 1923. Under the leadership of Ataturk, it established a form of democracy based upon Western models. A unique program of education in the broadest sense was applied to a country in which the majority of the people were illiterate. 
It was fundamental education of the most comprehensive sort, and the results achieved have been truly amazing. past decade, the United States has furnished over half a billion dollars in military and economic assistance. Among the numerous programs undertaken have been extensive road building and irrigation projects. Egypt, though she has only a limited supply of the Middle East's most prized commodity, petroleum, does have a treasure in the Great Suez Canal, which speeds this oil to its European buyers. Today, the nationalized canal is being run as efficiently by the Egyptians as it was under the old Suez Canal Company. Aswan Dam was constructed many years ago. Today, a new and much higher dam is in the making at Aswan. This and other methods of water development may well be the key to future greatness for the Middle East. The oil reserves of the Middle East are the largest in the world. Western oil companies which have developed these reserves have spent millions for exploration as well as for housing, education, and medical care of their workers. From all this is coming a modern labor class in which the oil workers play a leading role. For these workers are the vanguard of industrialism, the pioneers of a system that is rousing the latent energies of the people and is transforming their lives. Beset with internal tensions and national rivalries, torn by the conflicting claims of tradition and the modern world, the Middle East moves into a future fraught with uncertainties, but richer with promise than at any other time in history.